Now, another thing about my interns. Once you're my intern, you're my colleague for life. So I have been working with Seed Kit ever since that time. Um, not only do I know Caleb well, I know these fine students just as well. And even when they graduate, such as Issa, she stays with us because I don't let her go. And they're going to tell you all about Seed Kit now. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, so, as has been said before, so uh, this seed kit is a self-contained lab in a box that, for now, contains physics, chemistry, and biology experiments that are basic and understandable for middle school to high school students, um, and are made of affordable, um, like reusable materials. Uh, founded by Caleb, but carried on by many more students at Wellesley right now, there are majors including uh, women's and gender studies, physics, chemistry, bio, we have all kinds of students from all kinds of classes. Um, so it keeps going strong. Um, and we'll now each talk a little bit about why Seed Kid is important to us. So for me personally, going from middle school to high school, it was a big jump in terms of, in middle school, it was all lectures and wrote memorization and then in high school all of a sudden we got to play with things so things I hated like physics and chemistry now I was like wait I can experiment with a tiny ball and I actually understand this concept better so it's deeply rooted in me that experiential learning is really important and not only engaging students but also help them really understand what they're learning so I'll talk a little bit about constructivism. So that's like one of the pedagogies that we strongly believe in at SeedKit. Many of us became science majors when we came to Wellesley. And just like Mabel was talking about, it's that experiential learning, right? The process of having a science experiment in your hands and being able to see what's happening in real life, that is the best way that we believe to learn science. And it follows this idea of constructivism where you put students in a place where they are able to construct their own understanding and knowledge of a subject. So when you're doing an experiment, right, you're not just reading about science, you're doing the actual science yourself. And you are constructing how you're interacting with that science and creating your own experience. And we believe that's, you know, the most salient way to teach science and also to draw out misunderstandings because you have to be able to do the experiment in order to understand it. Uh, hi, I definitely agree with what Mahek and Meva just said. And one last thing I want to highlight is that what we want to bring is the ability or opportunity for students to ask questions. If they're seeing what they're doing, as Mahek mentioned, they're more likely to interact with the material to say, okay, but I learned this in class, and how does this relate to this thing I'm observing? Why does this fall a certain way? Why does this turn a certain color? Which leads them to reinforce the concepts that they've learned in class, which makes science a lot more fun because learning in a class basically all theoretical, makes it a little more bland. So we want to put a little spark in there with our kids. So how do we make these protocols? So our kit has two components. There's the materials that you can use to experiment with, play around with, but also you need some guidance because well, while I can play with a pendulum, exactly how do I play with it in order to understand the physics behind it, right? So we make protocols, and the way we organize it is we make uh, what we call webs. That's, so there's biology, but what about biology do, do we want to discuss at the level of middle school slash high school? So things like plant biology, cell biology, but within those we branch out more. So once we make a web for biology in general, then we take one of them, those are links, sorry for the invisibility. Uh, so you can click on that link and it takes you to, okay, if you want to do plant biology, for example, you can focus on all of these things, like you can do the leaves, the shoots, reproduction, all these categories. So the idea is to make our kit balanced, that uh, we have a biology kit, but we don't want it all to be about plants. Some of it would be human biology, some of it evolution, like the different parts, just to make sure we have some balance. Um, and the actual process um, involves first brainstorming. We do this as a group. We also have different factions where 
there's the biology group, the physics group, the chem group. We brainstorm together from like labs we've done in middle school, high school, even college introductory levels. We look up YouTube videos. Those also happen to be really useful. Um, and just like labs we've written before, we like brainstorm what could be better about them and how can we expand them. Next is actually writing the protocols. These we do mostly individually, and then we go over them together to see which ones are like more engaging or like teach students better. Uh, the next step is testing. This is Caleb right here, uh, soldering some things in preparation for, uh, like I think this one was uh, building a solar panel. So we took all these garden uh, lights and took out the solar panels from inside, put them together and made a charger for batteries. Um, so after that testing, we customize our tools, like what can fit in this box and what's like cheap enough to be in the box. Um, and then we get together again and we critique it. So, oh, before I get to the slide actually, I wanna say all of this, in order to be organized, we have these protocol sessions with Wendy where she trains us on how to write them so that it includes important components like lab safety, uh, what are the objectives of this lab? What are you supposed to learn? Previous questions, post-lab questions. So they actually get something out of it and reflect on their, what they got out of it. And then this is just to demonstrate how easy and simple the labs can be. Uh, discussing something like conservation of energy in physics. You can do it with uh, two balls, for example. So if I, all it takes is just gonna be a tennis ball, bouncy ball, some stable hands. You'll see why I'm saying stable hands. <laughs> um, and just good eyes just to see where the balls are going. So here, I'm gonna drop this tennis ball from this height. It bounces back up, but not as much. That's because some of the energy is lost to heat. And then this one, it also bounces back up, back up but not much, right? Now I'm gonna put this tiny one on top of the big ball. Okay, let's see. It goes flying, I'll catch that later. <laughs> so, thank you. So the idea here, is, of course in a protocol this would be more organized and measured heights, measured mass, all these parameters, but to demonstrate to you guys, well these had their own speeds going back, but bouncing back up, they would ideally have the same speed they had while hitting the table if they hadn't lost it. But this time, this bigger one is bouncing, hitting the smaller one and sending it up. So momentum is conserved, which is like, well, it's, it's basically like if you had some speed on this one and this one stops moving, that speed must have been transferred to this one. So that's why if this one stops, this one goes flying. There's also another factor where this is elastic. So if it goes, it contracts and then expands back up, this, it gives it more energy to jump back up. So these kinds of concepts may be hard to just do on pen and pencil, but once the students see them get excited, run around with the balls, it's really easy to understand. And another one is just simple. So here's just to show, oh, how does the length of a pendulum affect its period? So you wanna have a guess? Uh, is a longer pendulum gonna oscillate faster or a shorter pendulum? Shorter, I feel like we have physicists here. So <laughs> that kills the like ending line. But anyway, you can have one student count how many oscillations happen while the other one counts time. And then that gives you how many oscillations per 10 seconds, for example. And then you can have another student, well, one demonstrates the other counts time, the other counts uh, how many oscillations actually happen, and you can actually demonstrate that change in uh, uh, period, what's called like how much time it takes to complete one um, oscillation. So instead of just giving them the math, oh, then T is just proportional to one over the length of the pendulum, you show them this and then they can actually relate. So that was the idea. Next uh, is gonna be uh, Mahek talking about her experience in Ghana. Okay, so now we have a bunch of protocols, we have a bunch of experiments, right? 
But our goal is really to be teaching these experiments in under-resourced environments. So after we spent about a year and a half developing experiments and protocols, we were actually approached by Connie Chow, who's the director of the exploratory in Ghana. Um, she found us because I've been a mentor for Science Club for Girls, and she was previously a director of Science Club for Girls, and it's a hands-on after-school mentorship program in the Cambridge area. And she contacted me by email and was like, I've heard about your project. I run After School Science Club for Girls in Ghana. Can you send over some experiments? So in the summer of actually 2015, she took over some of our experiments and uh, trained teachers in using them. And they had a really, really great time. The teachers loved the experiments. And they loved it so much that she wanted us to join, she wanted her, us to join her to go to Ghana in the following summer. So in 2016, Caleb and I, traveled to Ensawam, Ghana, which is in the outskirts of Accra, to deploy prototypes of our seed kit. And this would be the first time that we were using seed kits with teachers, with students, um, not here. So it was really exciting and really terrifying, but ended up being one of the best experiences I've had while at Wellesley. Um, so I'm going to just walk you through some of the challenges that we faced while we were on the ground in Ghana, um, some of the great successes we've had, and then how our project kind of changed after that experience. Um, so yeah, this is summer 2016. So first of all, what did we do in order to prepare for this trip? So in order to have, in, like, to be able to measure how well we did with the kits that we were preparing, we worked really closely with Wendy as well as KC Patanayak in the statistics department to come up with questionnaires. So before we went to Ghana, we wanted to be able to measure students' attitudes towards science, as well as how they related to the kits, and then how, if they learned anything from the experiments that we brought over. So we had a series of questions about attitudes towards science. So I don't know if you can see that, but it says things like, it is important for me to learn science. I like learning about biology. I like learning about math. Um, I do hands-on science experiments in the classroom. So this was just demographics. We wanted to know like what the students were already doing in classrooms to make sure that you know the seed kit would be applicable. And then we had content-based questions. So we were going to do three different experiments, one in biology, one in chemistry, and one in physics with the students that we, did, that we met in Ghana. And we wanted to measure if you know, before there was some, like, if we were able to teach content effectively. So we had questions about um, content-specific questions about the experiments that we were running. And our goal was really to see how students were reacting to our protocols. So, you know, we wrote them in kind of like in a lab, right? We didn't, we, we didn't have the ability to share them with students. So we wanted to make sure that the protocols made sense to teachers and students, as well as make sure that... Um, the experiments were actually interesting to them. So this was a lot of qualitative and quantitative data collection. Um, yeah. So what we learned upon arrival. So the first kind of, we did 10 weeks in Ghana. And the first two weeks, I would say, was just meeting people. We arrived on the ground and we met with five different teachers in five different schools in the outskirts of Accra. And when we got there, it was really great because the teachers we met with were super collaborative and super eager to work in partnership with us. They already had amazing ideas about how to teach hands-on science experiments. They just needed resources. So that's kind of where we realized that we had the ability to provide those resources. We could fill a need. We weren't just coming with a solution where there was no need. Um, so when we got there, we decided to meet with students and teachers. And we learned that students really enjoy hands-on learning activities. This is um, actually in one of our schools. They had a cooking contest. So <laughs> there were a bunch of students who were already learning about science and cooking. So like that's already learning about science in your everyday life, right? Um, there was lots of enthusiasm from both teachers and students. The teachers were like constantly asking us for more experiments. They were like already had all of these ideas for things that they could do. They were buying experiments with their own money to do in classrooms. Um, and we also um, had just a great time getting to know the people on the ground and really becoming community partners. Um, we also learned that you know, there were some things that could be addressed. So the schools relied heavily on rote memorization in order to teach science. So most times when we got to the classroom, the science uh, curriculum consisted of a teacher who may or may not have a background in science sitting at the front of, front of a classroom, reading from a textbook, and then the students kind of standing up individually and then repeating back, you know, a passage from a textbook. 
Um, we also noticed that some of the questions, so we actually became really good friends with the printing lady in town, and she is responsible for writing all the exams that students read. So we had a chance to actually look through the questions that they used on exams, and some of them were surprising, like, um, what was the first computer God invented? Human, brain, hands, and water. Um, we noticed that a lot of the uh, questions were just based on memorization. So, you know, they were teaching ICT, which is like computer training. And the computer questions, these students had never seen a computer. They were required to memorize things like the mouse is a blank device without ever seeing a mouse in their life. So there were things that, you know, we realized that there were definitely higher level um, barriers that we wouldn't be able to address, but we could at least bring in experiments so that the things that students were being tested on, they would have a chance to see before they had to do a practical on an examination. Um, so, okay, so one of the first experiments we did was physics. This is one of my favorite experiments because I'm a physicist, but like, <laughs> it's also really fun and simple. So um, we had the students uh, learn about gravity using paper clips on a string and sound. And this sounds like crazy, but <laughs> basically you have the students create two different strings of paper clips. And one, um, the paper clips are evenly spaced, and on the other they're spaced by the natural law square, so they go like two, four, and then like, you know, they're even just spaced of, like by squares. I'm don't, not going to go too into depth because it might get a little confusing. <laughs> um, but basically you can actually listen to the sound of the rhythm that the paper clips make when they hit the ground when you drop both of them, and it explicates how gravity works, and the fact that gravity is, goes as um, time squared. So like you'll listen to the differences in the sound and have a very fundamental understanding of an equation. And when we did this with students, it was amazing because first of all, they were super surprised by the differences in the sound because it was contrary to what they thought. Um, when you drop the one that the paper clips that are evenly spaced, it sounds like it's speeding up. And when you drop the one that's spaced with, uh, by the natural law of squares, it sounds even. So there's not only a physical representation of an equation, it's like an auditory representation of an intuition that you have that is wrong, but you can explain with an equation. Um, so this is just an example of like some of the girls in our class working together, you know. Um, Something that we realized is that students don't have a lot of experience with tactile learning, so we had to teach them how to like tie knots on paper clips. So like that was really um, that was like hard for us because it was like it we were in a very different environment, right? We were in kind of like right outside of a city, so the students had access to television. They had access to like they, there were computer centers. So they weren't necessarily engaged in like hands-on creative things that people in the suburbs, like very far out in the suburbs, might be engaging in. So the students didn't have as much tactile um, knowledge. So that was like being able to, you know, have an experiment where you can just like tie paper clips on a string was teaching them these tactile-based skills. Um, so. Some of the experiments that we did with the students, we did a control and then an experimental group. So we did, we split up our uh, classrooms into two groups. And with one group, we did an engineering activity. So it wasn't related to biology, chemistry, or physics. And with the others, we did biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, so biology acted as our control experiment. So in both cases, we didn't actually teach biology to either of the classes. And we had them take two examinations, one pre and one post, about the uh, like content-based questions. And as you can see, there wasn't a huge difference. Um, the blue is a control group and red is experiment for the pre and post surveys. So the students are getting the same number of questions, of answers, right and wrong. This is right, sorry. Um, for chemistry, we saw a huge difference in the number of questions that students were getting right before and after they used the seed kit. So as you can see here, there's not a huge difference. This is pre doing the seed kit. There's not a huge difference between the experimental and control students. But then afterwards, you see that the experimental group really learned. You know, there were all these questions about like pH indicator and um, whether water is acidic or vinegar. So after we did our experiments, students were demonstrating that they had gained some knowledge, which is always good. Um, and then physics, we saw that okay, this is where how we can improve our protocols, right? 
we saw that, okay, students aren't understanding the concept of acceleration as well as they're understanding velocity. So what is it in our protocols that doesn't explicate acceleration as well as velocity? How do we improve our, th their understanding of that particular topic? So this was really like the meat of why we were there, is really to see if the protocols, the curriculum was actually useful. Um, and then on the last day, while we were there, we did teacher training. So we sat down with the five teachers that we had developed relationships with, and we taught them all of the experiments in our kits. And then we left each of them a kit to use in their classrooms. Um, so you can see we kind of spent the whole day. It was really fun. Um, and the teachers asked a lot of great questions. They were really excited that, you know, these are things that they did in, like, when they were training to become teachers. And now we were teaching them how to do those same things, but with pencils and, like, salt water. So we were using low-cost low resources that they could find locally, um, that, and then we provided them with things that they couldn't find locally, like batteries. Um, and then they could teach these experiments that they knew that they were learning about in college, learning about in high school, and wanted to do in their classrooms, but just didn't have the resources to do. Um, yeah, and then we did focus groups with our students. So we got to sit down, we like bought everybody snacks, and we just had them like talk about their attitudes towards science, their attitudes towards hands-on experiments, and then what they were looking for in their science um, experiences. So the biggest thing that we heard was that students just wanted resources, right? Like a lot of the girls that I talked to, they said that like there would be lab practicals where the, the teacher would ask you to come up to the class and like fill a beaker to this level and then do an experiment and they had never seen a beaker before. Um, they wanted a science laboratory so they wanted access, they wanted to feel like scientists and this is like a very fundamental thing. Um, and then of course there was like, we were also trying to address attitudes towards math and this was more prevalent I think than um, any like, usually girls, I was doing the focus group for girls, girls actually liked science. A lot of them saw the utility of science in their everyday life. You know, they understood that it's used for cooking, it's used for medicine. A lot of girls were like, I want to be a nurse, so of course I want to do science. And then, but math was not as um, prevalent. So we were thinking like in the future, maybe thinking about how to make physics and make math more apparent in its utility. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, really? Still like that even here? Yeah. So like some of the conclusions that we drew from that summer is that, you know, we need to definitely address attitudes towards math in addition to science, just because math is crucial to your understanding of science. But also that um, it's really resources that students need and that we can fill that need. Thanks, Mahek. So now I'll tell you a little bit about my summer, which is... 2017. Um, so coming into summer two, Mahek and Caleb had already provided, provided a lot of background. We knew slightly what to expect. We weren't completely just going in blind. So we had a chance to fix some of the things that we had done not as well the first time. First, we adapted a little bit the surveys and we tried to have uh, a different approach to the questions we were coming up with. And asking ourselves, okay, what, what really do we want answered and how are these questions going to help us improve? And so this is pretty much what we were thinking constantly when trying to adapt, not even just the question itself, but the format of the question. Um, the other thing we realized was students don't really know how to answer open-ended questions, mostly because they're not taught to in their exams, um, probably due to time constraints or um, teachers having to grade so many papers due to large size class, uh, sizes. Um, so uh, that was another problem. And the other thing was we had very long and redundant surveys. So we wanted to make it as concise as possible and as precise as possible. Um, here are some examples of the kind of questions we came up with. So example number one was, okay, we want to answer how do students approach science problems? So we come, came up with questions like, um, when you have not been able to answer a question in your science homework, what do you do? Do you leave the question blank? Do you guess the answer? Or do you spend time trying to answer the question? Um, and we were just generally trying to understand, okay, what, what are you thinking when you're looking at your science homework? Um, another question is, 
what, what resources do you do? Who do you go to for help? Your teacher, your classmates or friends? Do you go to someone who lives with you? Do you go to a book? Um, or do you just skip the question? Um, then another example that I thought was super important was we wanted to answer, okay, is there a difference between uh, boys and girls in terms of choosing to study science at a higher level in senior high school? Um, junior high school is the equivalent of middle school, and then senior high school is just our regular high school. And so the question is, if you plan on going to senior high school, which subjects do you want to study? And we let them, you know, circle as many as you want. And Wait, what's senior high school? Is it like college? Senior high school is just regular high school. Yeah. Um, and so... so like it's like specialized, like college, basically, like special. Uh, it, it's just high school. Yeah, uh, they, they just choose Sorry, different like, subjects. If you plan on going to high school, what do you, what, like, what do you plan to major in, essentially? So, like, in Ghana, do they have majors in high school? Uh, they just have fields of concentration, and they get to pick some of their classes, but, uh, yeah. And based on the numbers that we saw after we entered all the surveys, was that 53% of the girls that we surveyed in two of the, the two classes we performed the experiments with, um, said they wanted to study science in senior high school, and 37% of the boys said they wanted to study uh, science in high school. But the reality of this is that the number of girls that actually study science in senior high school is incredibly lower than compared to boys. So what is going on? Um, and we realize there's a lot of factors that are playing into it. There's a lot of cultural factors playing into it. There's um, mostly cultural factors that uh, kind of keep girls from saying, yes, I want to study science, uh, but science is for boys. So they have a harder time saying, this is what I want to do. Um, we also wanted to design new protocols just because we want to con continue to increase the number of protocols that we have available in our kits. So we came up with the pendulum uh, practical that Meva showed earlier. And we also created a protocol for genetic, for a genetics experiment, which didn't require any materials, but we tried to make it incredibly engaging, something that, you know, Punnett squares are usually not our favorite subject, and we don't like drawing squares and filling them out. So we made it more interactive. And here's a picture of actually uh, the outcome of the experiment. And that little uh, drawing there is Edna. And the students, as a class, actually used, um, followed the protocol and created two parents genetically. And then they said, okay, well, what, what is this kid going to look like? And so they came up with, they, they chose, okay, we want trait from mother for number one, and then we want the trait from the dad for number two. And, you know, eventually they realized, okay, well, now we have all these genes. What do they actually look like? And so we made a picture of what this person would look like with some traits that are known to be dominant. And they had a blast doing this. They were laughing the entire time. They might have not been touching and exper touching materials, but they were so engaged and they were laughing, um, which is goal number one is to make them smile and have fun. Um, and then the last experiment was exploring density and we always have more fun when there's colors involved. So they got to see how uh, the density of water increased based on the amount of salt that you were adding to the water. And then you had to put it in a little flask to see, okay, well, which uh, water is at the bottom and which water is at the top? And they had to actually think, okay, well, this color, we definitely added more salt to this color, so it should be at the bottom. Um, and sometimes, you know, it was really hard for them to get the layers perfect, um, so they were having a hard time understanding why. But those are actually the most important questions, is why did this not work? Because solving that question an answers so many other questions that are usually not addressed when you're trying to memorize things and memorize concepts. So those were, those were the three new protocols that we created for the summer. Um, at the beginning of the summer, like Mahek mentioned, I spent a lot of time with Connie, uh, the founder of the Exploratory, 
making connections with people, meeting some of the most amazing and hardworking people in the science field in Ghana. Um, for example, this is Tina. She runs um, the Ghana Code Club and is constantly running programs all around the country uh, with girls and teaching them how to code and empowering them through computer science. Um, this, for example, is an orthopedic training center where Gloria, this woman to the left, taught, gave us a tour of the facility and told us, okay, well, we have a lot of girls and boys living here with us full time trying to recover from their different orthopedic problems and we want to join the exploratory and kind of learn the science behind all the, um, all the um, apparatuses that they use for themselves to, you know, like some, some of them have prosthetics legs, so why don't we teach our kids, how does this work? How does the science make me walk again? So um, those are just examples of what I did and the people I met while I was there. And I cannot speak better about them. They are absolutely amazing. Um, we all, I also had a chance to work with teachers in different settings. Um, to the left, or to the right, uh, is a picture of me with Mustafa. He's probably one of my favorite people on earth. And he was working with the exploratory, teaching uh, the teachers how to use this online or offline server called Rachel, where that allows the teachers to access tons of um, resources online, like TED Talks and podcasts and online textbooks that they can use as alternative resources for their classes. Um, we also got a chance to do a teacher training at the end of the summer with all of the teachers that are part of the exploratory. So here are just a couple pictures of some of the uh, women presenting on a little project that they were assigned. They were told, okay, you grab this system, this body system, and use all of these materials that I honestly just found anywhere I could. And I told them, okay, this is what you got make something out of it because this is what it would be like in your classroom. You have to use whatever you see around you. And so they came up with different systems and they tried to use all of the materials according to the specific body part. Um, and this is probably my favorite. They were trying to model the lungs and they use a water bottle um, with a balloon on the top, that little orange thing. And they created pretty much a vacuum that when the, the little, you can't see it, but there's a little bag. When you pull the bag, it's simulating diaphragm contraction and relaxation, and the lungs actually uh, inflate and deflate um, according to the diaphragm motion. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic, and I don't know if, where they got that idea, but I was fascinated. <laughs> um, so as, as, as Mahek mentioned earlier, they, they have all the energy and they want to do it. They just need a little push. That's all they need, because they've got all the ideas. Um, and here I am doing one of the C-Kit experiments, the chemistry one that I did with the kids, um, t teaching them how to do it and how, not, not exactly the science behind it, because they know the science, but what questions to ask when you're teaching the protocol, and how to encourage the kids to ask more questions, or just in general engage more with the material. And some of the teachers actually were asking me questions and they were saying, okay, but what if this doesn't work? They're gonna ask me, why doesn't this work? I was like, okay, well, try doing it a different way and just see if it works because you are anticipating those questions, so you try to solve them, solve them yourself. And they were like, but no, I'm asking you the question. <laughs> I, you have to answer the question. I said, no, you know the answer. And they don't realize that they know the answer, but they really do. Um, and lastly, I had a chance to work with students, which is, I could talk about it for ages, because there was not one student that I didn't like. And um, I got to do a lot of things with them. I got to work with the exploratory clubs, which are just science clubs for girls, essentially. Um, here we did an experiment where the girls learned how to take their own pulse and we did a short experiment where they had to take their pulse walking and then we'd walk around the room a little faster and then I'd make them go outside and do jumping jacks and uh, they had a blast. Um, 
And so we generally said, okay, put down all your times after you measure your poles and we'll see the general trend. And obviously they were able to anticipate that as they did more exercise, their pulse was going to go up. But they were able to see it. And I told them, you know, you guys are scientists right now. You just did an experiment. You did that all on your own. Um, and I think it allowed them to take more ownership of what they had learned. And here's a, another picture of them doing, uh, one of the classes doing the chemistry experiment, uh, taking the surveys. And that was just a bunch of primary kids that loved hanging around me. All of a sudden I turn around and I'm surrounded by a hundred kids. And all they wanted to do was teach me a song. And so I let them, I knew absolutely nothing of what they were saying, but I played along with it and taught them different songs. Um, but being with the students was by far my favorite thing all summer. And the biggest thing that I learned was that we often think that we are the teachers and the professor or teacher stands up there um, and lectures. But what I realized was that I felt like the student pretty much the entire summer because they were convinced that I was their teacher, but they had no idea that that's not true. They were actually teaching me so much from how they learn or what they want to learn or what works and what doesn't. So I don't think I could thank them enough for what they contributed to SeedKit, really. Um, so in general, what is next for SeedKit? We are tr avidly trying to recruit new members, so people in the crowd who are interested, our applications are open today. Um, we want to continue to analyze the data from last summer and this summer as well because it has been very helpful so far. We want to improve and create more protocols because we can never come up with enough. We also want to come up with new fundraising ideas um, and finalize our business model as well uh, that we've been working on for the past year. Additionally, we want to keep improving our kit, which um, is a sample is below. It has some of the experiments. Uh, not all of them, but we are really working on trying to make it as compact and as beautiful as possible. Um, and lastly, we want to prepare for next summer because we cannot imagine not doing this again. Um, and so far, this is what we, this is where we are and who we're working with. Again, we're in Ghana, in Ghana um, right outside of Ghana in a town called Pukwasi. Um, which is very close to Accra, the capital. We are also working with Wings College Prep Academy, um, led by Alessandra Farak, and we're trying to establish a project through a student that just simply showed interest in the project, and we're trying to create a, a network there as well. And lastly, we're also establishing a network with the town of Framingham and the public school system. And we want to thank all these beautiful people who have been incredibly supportive, including Rocio here, uh, Alessandra Farag, uh, Casey Patanaya, the statistician, Dave Ellerby, um, the exploratory team, uh, each of them is amazing, and um, as well as the Babson and Wellesley College uh, business competitions who gave us some of our essential funding for the summers. So thank you very much to these people. Um, and lastly, shameless plug, um, we met Mahek, Caleb, and I when we went to Ghana. We became really close with a family in town, um, in the town of Ensawam. That is Portia, and this is her daughter, Diotima, and her daughter, Fifi. And they are by far the two best girls in the world and the most amazing mother in the world. And she owns her own shop. She's one of the, I mean, I'm a little biased, but she's the best seamstress in town. And she made a bunch of stuff for me and Heck and Caleb last summer. But she also made a bunch of headbands um, that we that I fell in love with. I'd walk into her store and I'd just pick up a piece of you know cloth and put it around my head. And next time I come to visit, she has made this beautiful headband for me. Um, just because she thought I would like it. And so we decided she worked so hard to make all of the headbands we have displayed in the back um, and we're using the money that we get from the headbands to support her business um, as a equity um, team or equity uh, oriented team we want to support businesses in the local 
community of Ensawam. So um, part of the money will go to her, and part of it will be used by us to create or buy lab coats for the students in the exploratory clubs so that they get a little more ownership of the experiments they're doing and just feel really cool because that's important. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much.